Data journalism is something brand spanking new. It relies entirely on the technologies of the moment and didn't exist before 2009. Well, that's the commonly held view, but how right is it? In fact, journalists at The Guardian have been wrestling with data since the very first issue of 1821 and have been trying to present that data in interesting ways to bring those stories alive for the readers. Here we have the bound edition, bound volume, the very first editions of The Guardian from 1821. In the front page, is all adverts. It's led by an advert for a lost black Newfoundland dog and adverts for other local businesses in Manchester. It was seven pence, which is quite expensive in those days because four pence of that was uh, a tax, a stamp duty. You can just about see the stamp at the top in the corner. And all the news in those days was on the inside and on the back and uh, it's given to kind of long kind of discussive pieces. And here on the back page is in essence the first example of Guardian data journalism. It's really a table of data, just a long table of data, and there's stuff now that wouldn't be controversial. Essentially, it's a list of every school in Manchester with how many children were in each school and how much each cost, girls and boys, 60 years before compulsory education. This was incredibly political. And this was leaked to somebody known to the editor, um, only given here as an initial, as NH. No document of a similar nature has yet been laid before the public. And this is the key quote here. At all times, such information as it contains is valuable because without knowing the extent to which education, and particularly the education of the labouring classes, prevails, the best opinions which can be formed of the condition of future progress of society must be necessarily incorrect. And I take that to mean that unless we know and we understand what's going on in the world through things like this, through data like this, then how can things improve and how can things get any better? 80 years since the first edition, and the front page is all, again, still adverts, which carried on to the 1950s. And um, 91, obviously, in the middle of the Boer War. Um, and this is the first you know, major industrial war of the 20th century. And the, the paper's just full of stories, such as um, the invasion of Cape Colony and casualty lists and so on. And the first photographs weren't really reproduced in The Guardian for another few years after this, till 1905. So the, uh, the layout designers fell back on kind of an ingenious technique for representing something that's actually quite visual which is the new brigade structure, new South African tactics from the war. And it's a graphic, it's like ASCII art, essentially. It's a graphic made up of type. All of the elements on here are letters. They're less of the alphabet or they're lines. Things that have been very, very simple and easy for people to reproduce in a kind of clear way because it's quite a complicated thing. They were trying to show where the front half of the battalion was, the left half of the battalion, that where the major goes, in those days have firing lines at the front of a battalion, and the, the men here are represented by these little, these little O's and more text here. And this is the earliest graphic that I could find going through the archives, a diagram, a representation of data, if you like. War and military action is one of those areas that have always uh, produced graphics and visualizations. Often you're visualizing places that people don't really know about. They know it's somewhere away, they've never been there often, and you're trying to show also what's happening where. So traditionally we fall upon maps and so on. And this page from during the Battle of the Somme to me kind of shows both of those kinds of data visualization. This was drawn in October 1916. Now the Battle of the Somme started in July. It was supposed to be over very, very quickly. Um, it had been an enormous kind of military investment by the Allies, but I mean, it hadn't worked. And what this shows you is the groundwork of what was still to come after all those months of pain and incredible losses of life. They still had major bits of land and hills and very, very difficult land to get over. And it was the kind of the pain that lies ahead, what now lies ahead of the Allies' advance. And it's sections of the land. So you've got a little map showing where it is, but it's sections of the land. So you can really imagine how difficult that would have looked to people at home that after all this fighting and pain and bloodshed, we've still got to do this. So this is a chart from something called the Manchester Guardian Commercial, which was a regular commercial supplement. Um, which came out alongside the paper. And this is a kind of quite serious stuff about London Clearing Bank's assets. What were their assets made of? This is a proportional stacked line chart, which we do use sometimes now. But obviously you can see the importance and the freedom that colour gives us now with all this kind of cross-hatching and differentiation and explanation that's kind of required around it. And it showed how perhaps these visualisations were becoming um, ways of representing data which is incredibly complicated and difficult for people to understand in a kind of very easy visual way. So here we have something which is quite interesting because it's a graphic, a visualisation as a reassurance technique. Now in 1943 obviously America was in the war and America with all its resources was sending some of those resources to the UK 
and some of these things were military equipment, bombers and tanks and planes and so on. So you can see here, each of these symbols represents 10% of January to March production. The other thing that we were having as well from America, which we desperately needed, was food. Again, pointing out the very small amounts that were coming to the UK. So it's a kind of graphic to reassure people that they're going to be all right. And you can see how those graphics have moved on in a sense from the ones we were looking at from 1938, where they were basically saying to people, this is, these are the facts, this is how you will be affected by the war. Something where they're basically saying to people, you'll be all right, and look, here's the visual proof. This is a, the rather lovely observer from November the 10th, 1957. And the papers are much more visual. This brilliant picture of a volunteer at Farnborough when we still had a space industry in the UK. And the paper is just full of coverage of Sputnik. What was going on? What is the motive? What does it mean for us? The key question which a lot of people have been asking themselves, how do they stay up? I mean, imagine a gun mounts on a tower so high that it protrudes beyond where the atmosphere ends into the vacuum of space. And you can see the diagram and see how fast things have to move to stay above ground and uh, to keep going around the planet. So this is something just from uh, 2013, the, uh, just after the Russian meteorite hit near Moscow. And uh, it just shows every meteorite on Earth that we know about. We just got all the data that we could from the uh, Meteorological Society, which has a brilliant database, had 54,000 events on. And that data was very good for this because it had latitudes and longitudes in the data and meant that we could map it in really about 10 minutes. Can you imagine how uh, long it would take you manually to draw 50,000 circles and you've got something interactive which people can share and they can search. So we have speed on our side now in a way that I think people would really envy 20 or 30 years ago.